Uh, for those of you that don't know me or the, the, if you're new to us here in Phoenix, my name is Aaron Hawkins. My wife and I, she's, say hon, there's my wife right there, my beautiful wife. Uh, we, we, um, we serve full-time here on staff in Phoenix. We're about an hour away on the east side in Gilbert, Mesa, Queen Creek, that area. And, uh, but we always love coming out here. Uh, this is like a little second home to us. Uh, we got family out here. We actually just vacationed out here last week at uh, our, our very own vacation house, which is Lashana's parents' house. So, but we call it our vacation house. So, uh, because it's not my house, right? Um, so we're doing this series. So if, you're, if, you, if it's your first time with us, we're going through this series and it's called Come and See. Come and See. And it's, we're looking through some stories in the book of John and really, the, the point behind the stories and behind the series is we want to be able to see Jesus more clearly. We want to be inspired by him and feel loved by him to a point where we're willing to share with the lost world around us about this Jesus. When I say willing, that's a key word. You're inspired to do it. You're not required to do it. It's something that you just want to do because of what you see in him. And so, you know, that's the goal behind what we're talking about. Today, we're going to be looking at this woman, the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. You can be turning your Bibles over there. We're going to spend our entire time in John 4 until we get to the point where we take our communion. But and we're, going to, we're going to start it off. We're, we're going to do one of these things where you watch some movies where they show you the end, and then they show you how they got there, Right? We're just going to read the very end kind of of the story, the, the, the culmination here. Then, verse 28, leaving her water jar, the woman came back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. She got to the point where she had this interaction with Jesus and this time with Jesus, and she's like, y'all got to come and see this. Y'all got to come and see this. And we know that as the story goes, like a little later on, many Samaritans believed not just because of what she said, but because they also got that interaction with Jesus. But it was, you know, that, that what she said is what piqued their interest. And so we're going to look at this interaction that Jesus has with her and we'll talk about it. So before we do, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Thank you for this story. And as I think as we look at it, we're going to realize it, is, it, has, it can mean so many different things for us. So Lord, I pray that you're with us as we hear your word, as we look at this story. Help us to connect with you. Help us to understand this woman. And help us to be inspired. To, to, to go out and do what she did, where we tell other people, hey, come and see this Jesus. We love you. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. So we're going to read. We're going to read through the whole story. And here's what I want to ask you to do while we're reading through it, okay? And, and you guys got your paper Bibles because we're going to put the scriptures up here, but it's probably pretty small. And so you might need uh, paper Bibles. You might need your phones. So open them up, turn them on. But I want you to think about this as we're reading, okay? You know what reflective reading is? I'm making that word up right now. I don't know if this is a scientific thing. I want you to reflect on this. What do you see in Jesus as you're reading through this? And what do you see in yourself as you're reading through this? I preached this sermon out east already this morning, and afterwards I had a couple of guys come up to me, and they're like, man, that story might as well have been the man at the well after what we talked about. And so even for the brothers in here, I want you to be able to see yourself in this story, even though we're talking about the woman at the well. Amen? So think about that. John chapter 4, start at verse 4. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sikar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. 
When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone in town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And the Bible tells us for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water, the water from the well will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you are now, that you you now have is not your husband. What you have, what you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see your prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming. When you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. I want to talk to you this morning with the theme, with this theme, breaking barriers. You know, this story is really special in the Bible. And the more I've studied about it, I've learned so much and just, Gotten really excited about it, to be honest with you. But um, one of the things that you know that we might not know is this is one of the most extended interactions that Jesus has with one individual in all of scriptures. It's one of the very few times Jesus also indirectly says who he is to somebody as well. So there's something special about this story. And, and here's what I think. I think sometimes this woman in the story kind of gets a bad rap, right? Like she gets a little bit of a bad rap from us. Like like we start to think like, well, this woman was so terrible and so bad and had such a screwed up life that Jesus had to go to that town to reconcile her to him. And that, like that was her only hope. And while I do believe that Jesus had a mission of reconciliation in mind when it came to her relationship with him and her relationship with the Father in heaven. I I believe that's necessary for all of us, by the way. We all need that relationship, that reconciliation. I do think this story in the Bible is in, this story is in the Bible for other reasons as well. It's not just to demonstrate our need for a relationship with God. It's also to demonstrate our need to let the barriers that we can put up with one another come down. You know, to think about it, you know, God, we, we, we have vertical and horizontal relationships, like a cross, right? Vertical relationship, that's you and God. Your relationship with God. You know who's in charge of your relationship with God? You are. Not me. Not Ryan Jones. Not Isaac. Not your preacher. Not your family group leader. That don't work. You can't say, well, they said something and it bothered me, God, so I can't follow you no more. That just don't work. You are in charge of your relationship with God. You have always been and you always will be. God gives you all the tools that you need to discern what that looks like. But you have to, you have to take personal responsibility for that relationship with God. That's on who? 
You, me, yeah. I'm in charge of mine. And that's, that keeps me busy, okay? My relationship with God keeps me very busy for myself, okay? And um, I try to help other people with their relationships with God, but ultimately I can't make them have one. So that's the vertical one. But then we got the horizontal one. Touch somebody next to you. Can you touch somebody? There's some people that can, some people can't. That's the horizontal relationship, right, that we're talking about. Now, I know you can't stretch your arms across the room, but that's also a horizontal relationship. You know, there, you know, we're sitting, we're spanned across the room, but you know, we we know how it is sometimes. You get in a group this size, there's some people that are sitting across the room from each other intentionally. Horizontal relationships. We're trying to break down barriers. But you get onto society, what happens? Do you, what do you see? Same thing. Right? This story, I believe. We want to be reconciled to God. But we're going to learn a few things about these relationships, about breaking some barriers. Amen? I think she gets it wrong. So what do you see in Jesus that you need to imitate? What do you need to see in yourself here? A few things that we need to learn, a few truths that we need to be aware of. The Samaritan group, they are a group that is discriminated against just because of their ethnicity. To understand this woman, you need to understand that first. Her reality, the reality that she lived in every single day, was that to the Jews, who's she speaking to, by the way? Jesus, who's a Jew. To the Jews, she was viewed as a dog, as an animal, as a dog, as a low life. That's how she was viewed. That's just the truth that she lived in every day. The truth is, the Samaritans were despised. And no self-respecting Jew would be caught dead in the company of a Samaritan, especially a preacher, especially a guy that's trying to start a movement. They just, a teacher of the law would not be in Samaria. That would be all over Facebook and nobody would go to that guy's church anymore. That's how that would work, right? You know, it's amazing how it starts. Verse four, now he had to go through Samaria. No, he didn't. You can look at a map. Yeah, there's a road that went through Samaria. And if you had to get to the other side, that's you could take that one. But the self-respecting Jews, especially the teachers, they went the long way around because we're not going through that part of town. Anybody ever done that here in Phoenix? Or any other places? Oh, I don't I don't go that way. We don't we we take the 303 or whatever the one that goes all the way around out here. But you understand what I'm saying, right? They would go all the way around. But the text says he had to. He had an appointment at the well. He had to do what the other Jews weren't willing to do. And if you are going to be a Christ follower, I think we got some Christ followers in this room. If you are going to be a Christ follower, you have to be willing to do what other people are not willing to do. We need to live more like Jesus, talk more like Jesus, be more like Jesus. Those WWJD bracelets should never go out of style. But what I love about this story also is like how Jesus, he kind of puts himself on display here. And we get to see so much. Jesus knew the stigmas of the society that, that this woman faced, that the, the, the Jewish society, his society, put on the Samaritans. Jesus knew that. You know, the, uh, the Jews were known to get up in public place, and this was just normal. They would get up in public and pray and thank God that they are not like a sinful Samaritan. Can you imagine if somebody got up here and prayed they were not? like somebody from, I don't know, the Middle East or somebody not from, you know what I mean? Like you would be so offended if you heard that. I am not like that. But that was like a normal thing for them. If you were walking down the street and you saw a Samaritan walk in your your direction, you would cross the street. Not long ago, that happened here in the U.S. If you were walking down the street and you saw a Samaritan and and their shadow caught you, Some Jews thought that made you unclean. 
So you'd avoid them at all costs. That's just what stigmas they had to live with. We got to understand that truth. You know, and then you got, so she's a Samaritan woman. Double whammy, especially if you live in those days. Because women were considered second-class citizens. So she's the wrong gender, wrong ethnicity, and the society around her would constantly be reminding her of that. So we just got to remember that. What do you think? If that's somebody's life, if that's what the world that they live in, the culture that they live in, what do you think that would do to their self-esteem and their self-sense of worth? Just think about that. What would that do to somebody's self-esteem and their sense of worth? I know one thing that it would do for sure. It would create a hole in here, a hole in their heart, a hole in their soul. They, they, and, and that hole, they would do what every other one, every single person in here tries to do. We try to fill that up. When you fill a hole, you try to fill it up with something, right? You go after something. So we got to be very careful if we feel tempted to wag our finger at this woman at the well. Because honestly, if we found her, ourselves in her, her place, we, we might be looking for affirmation in all kinds of places. For her, it was relationships. But what about you? You ever found yourself looking for affirmation in different places? because you didn't get it from somewhere that you kind of expected to get it? You didn't get it from a place like, I mean, think about places that we expect affirmation from, but we don't always get it. Family, that's one. We expect it from culture, but it doesn't always happen. Sometimes it doesn't even happen in church. And what do we do? We start looking in other places. Where'd she go? Relationships. So let's just be careful. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but you know, so start looking in all the wrong places. And um, she shows up at the well, and the Bible says it was 12 o'clock. Now, that's an important detail for you. Because in that day, most of the women would go to get the water at the well, like, in the morning. It was hot out there. We can relate here in Phoenix. Like, when do you pick the weeds in the summertime? Like, 6 a.m., right? You're not doing it at three o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, you can, but that's a little crazy. But you're, you're waking up early in the morning or, or, or at night and you got a headlamp and you're trying to pick the weeds when it's only 90 degrees outside. But at least the sun isn't beating down on you. She shows up to the well at 12 o'clock. When most of, you know, we, you know, people, we've read this story and, you know, maybe they say she's a reject and that's why she had to go. And, you know, maybe that's the truth. But maybe she just didn't want to deal with anybody. You ever like Zoomed church on a Sunday? Because you're like, I just don't want to answer questions today. To the Zoom audience, I, we get you sometimes, right? I'm not suggesting you do that, by the way, all the time. Avoidance is not always a good way to handle your problems. But you ever been there where you're like, I just want to stay away? That's why I go to Valentine's Day dinner the week before Valentine's Day, because I don't want to deal with the crowds. That's why I do not go, I do not like, I used to work at a shopping mall. I don't like going to the mall at all, especially during Christmas. I don't even like driving near the mall during Christmas. I will go around, like, I, you know, most of the, the Jews did in Samaria. I go around the mall, because I'm judging every single person that's driving on the road that day during Christmas time. I just want to get, I don't want to deal with it, right? But you ever done that? You ever been tired? And you just want to go somewhere and be quiet? Maybe that's why she's like, I'll deal with the heat. I just want some peace and quiet while I'm drawing my, drawing my water from the well. Because I know what's going to happen when I'm there. People are going to talk to me. They're going to say nice things. They're going to smile on my face. But as I walk, I'm going to hear the chatter. And I know they're going to be talking about me. So I'm going to hear it back in the village. You know, that happens at church sometimes too, right? That happens in the office place. You smile at somebody, and then they walk by, walk away, and you say, man, she's struggling. You guys be praying for her. 
Y'all be praying for him. Man, he's really going through it. The chatter. Sometimes I wish we could just smile and keep it at that. Right? She gets to the well. So imagine, put yourself in the...